While we're working through that, we're going to go ahead and get started because I am sensitive to everyone's time. And so um, this session is really um, all about um, anything dealing with money. So financial aid, um, billing, um, those two kind of go hand in hand together. And I don't know if you all do like, you can raise your hand, how many have actually um, sat through a presentation during any of the um, registration slash orientation programs. Thank you. I guess no one has, I don't know. So um, the Office of Student Financial Assistance um, jointly with our student accounts um, services um, present to parents during orientation because one, we realize that um, that is important for parents <laughs> as well as students, but we want to get parents um, involved in that process because typically they're involved in one way or the other. In many cases, when we're talking our tr traditional age students, but this information is actually helpful for, um, I think, all. So I'm going to go ahead and um, so this is, I can drive it, I guess. I guess I can't. I'm hitting it. Advance. Um, and so let me just back up. I'm Leah Stewart, Assistant um, Vice President for Enrollment and Financial Assistance. So the financial aid piece is a, is a huge part um, of what I do and have actually um, been in that arena or space for many years. And then um, in the past, I would say 10 years or so, um, the whole admissions piece and enrollment management piece became part of also what I do. So the onboarding of our, our new students, whether they're first time freshmen or transfer, or even with our partnership with AOL, well, academic partnerships for our AOL programs, um, all the way through to then looking at affordability. So access and affordability, if you think about kind of the pillars. But if in terms of now, just focusing on financial aid, just so you know what happens in the Office of Financial Assistance, we have financial aid coordinators that um, see students wherever they are, whether it is face-to-face, -face, um, rather as they email us to our office email account, um, or we have chat bots now, which is that artificial intelligence that we can um, actually meet with students, um, have conversations with them kind of 24 seven. If there's something that can't be explained through that process, then one of our staff members will actually reach out to the students to follow up with them. We also have chat um, appointments to allow students to um, allow for that privacy where students may want to um, interact, maybe not come on campus, but interact from the comforts of their home or, or residence halls or wherever they are. But in terms of how we communicate, one of our primary ways of communicating to students is their um, NKU email address. And that's kind of university wide. We really want students to get in the habit of checking their email on the regular basis. I should say more importantly, reading their email on a regular basis and taking whatever appropriate action. So they'll get information about tuition and bills that's sent. Really, once we roll out the, the uh, bills, then they get a monthly statement, like some, similar to say a credit card statement. They're getting a monthly um, statement in their um, NKU email address. And we know some students will forward that to some of their personal e email addresses, and we don't mind that. The important thing is that they're reading that. Um, for the bill, paper uh, bills or invoices are not generated, and that's why it's critical that students read their email. Financial aid, missing information, notices, and things of that nature, we will send that via email. We also will send a heart document to their home. And so they can access information um, you know, from their sm smartphones, um, they can look at our websites, our homepage um, information, um, you know, all of that, if you want to advance. Okay. Um, when you're talking to students, um, just as 
the registrar will emphasize because FERPA really, really, I would say, lay, it resides in that office, I should say. That's kind of the home office for that, the university registrar. But we want to ensure that you know if the student has completed the FERPA and allowed you to talk to their parent. And that information is found in the registrar. And Jamie, I'm not certain if the registrar is having a session with this group or not, but I would think they'll cover that information. Um, in terms of just an overview of what students have access in their MyNKU, they can view their um, bill, they can view their financial aid statuses, they can take action on their financial aid so they can accept, they can decline um, that information, they can enroll in direct deposit, they can register for classes, that's kind of outside of this, but this is how it looks. So um, how many of you have the counselor um, tab so that you can look at some of this stuff? Okay, so I do see some hands up. Um, and some, I just, I don't know, because I don't see faces. I see some thumbs up. I see a few hands up, a few thumbs up. So with regards to, again, my NKU, that there is a student self-service area, as well as there's an area of what you, which you all can go to. And that's basically the counselor tab where you can look at things that a student can see. So in their portal, in terms of their student self-service where they can take care of things, they can again, look at Biller Direct so they can view their tuition, their, tu their tuition statement. Because again, we're, mail we're sending well, student account services is sending that information monthly to their email account, but they can go in 24 seven and actually look at that. It advanced for some reason, and they can go into the other thing. So again, that's fine. They can view their account online. So again, that's, that's basically 24 seven, whenever they get into their, their portal. And what they'll see is um, they can look at their, their bill. So, the target date is July the 20th. That student account services is saying that their fall bill will be there. They can see what their tuition is. They can see housing and any other fees that are applied to their account. They can see that. They can also see if they dropped a class or added a class. So again, the bill is sent to them, but they don't, do not have to wait on that monthly statement. They can go in th themselves. If you want to advance, please. Thank you pay their bill. There's an option of which they can actually pay online. So we have the e-check, which is free. The credit card, there is a convenience fee, if you will, on that, which is not uncommon. Um, if they want to do that, they would have to accept that. And if they can pay using these payment methods, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, or Discover, um, they can pay by mail if they wanted to write out a check or a money order. We advise no cash. Please tell students don't, don't put cash um, in the mail. And then in person. So our student account services, you all may have walked by. I, I know I walk by on a daily basis on the second floor of the administrative center where they can actually go in person. They can meet with someone, talk to someone about their bill. And if for some reason they come in after hours, there is a nightly um, Dropbox, and again, we do stress if um, that they do not um, pay cash. So fall tuition due date. So the, the due date is August the 23rd, um, 2021, of which 100% of their bill is due. However, we do know that some students will not pay 100% of their bill they may be interested in our payment installment plan. And that plan is a, there's a $50 um, payment installment fee. And then there is an account maintenance fee of 1.25% of the total remaining charges on their account. And so each month that fee, a little bit of that fee would be, then be applied to their account until their balance is due. And what happens is that they're going to uh, participate in the payment plan. There's three installments. The first installment 
50% of their bill is due. And then the second and third in installment, 25 and 25, to bring their account balance um, in, to be paid in full. And you will see that August, September, and then October, those due dates. But in the meantime, again, student account services will continue to send out the monthly uh, bill as well. Students can get in, like we said, into the student self-service and actually look at their bill. So now I'm going to talk a little bit, switch gears and talk a little bit about financial aid and basically that process. So one, that process, there is an annual financial aid application that students are encouraged to um, complete. And the reason for that is that's allowing students to maximize their aid um, available to them or their aid eligibility. <clears throat> One application and they're considered for a number of different aid types. So the application is available in October for the upcoming school year. And so we encourage students to complete the application to maximize their aid eligibility. Um, the application is a very, uh, I would say, very simplified process, um, not many questions on it. And it is asking for two prior tax years than the year in which they're in. So we would look at 2019 taxes for the 21-22 school year. And the reason for that, um, you'll, you will hear the term prior prior, is the federal, federal government realized that some families, some students may not have completed their free their I'm sorry, their, their taxes. And so in order to remove that barrier, they did a lot of research to see how much change from two years to say the current year of, in terms of income, not much change at all. So with that, it, with that said, they were like, well, in order for us to truly be able to remove a barrier, to help many students will remove the fact that if the student hadn't filed the current year taxes, that's not going to be an issue because they're looking back. Now, if there's been a change, then they can talk to the financial assistance office and we can work with students on an individual and case by case basis on any changes that if their current year is not reflective of their two year prior tax year then we can make those changes because some, in some cases life happens. Uh, there could be a situation where a family member, maybe the family size has changed. Um, a divorce or separation may have occurred. There may be a situation where um, a family member has either lost their income totally um, or have experienced a reduction. And so with those cases that may have negatively in, uh, impacted the financial strength of the family, we can make those changes. And we just direct students directly to the federal government website, because it's not an application that they would complete here at NKU. It's the federal government application, so the free application for federal student aid, and it's directing them to the studentaid.ed.gov and putting in our school code, the 009275 would allow us to get the information electronically. Okay, and so what are students being considered for? Again, I said one application, but look at all the A types that they're being considered for. Federal Pell Grants, the uh, federal subsidized and unsubsidized student loans, a Parent PLUS loan, federal work study, as well as for Kentucky residents, the Kentucky CAP grant, and then for all residents, the um, federal SCOG grant. Um, <clears throat> many of the programs are based on financial need, meaning we have to um, look at the financial strength of the family. So if that's the whole application process to actually determine what aid um, the student is eligible to receive. Now, I also want to take a, just a few minutes to talk about verification because you'll hear students talk about, you know, I completed the application and the financial aid office is asking now for additional information. We only ask for what the federal government requires us to ask for. So if the student is selected for verification, and I want to say about 30% or so of our student body population is selected, then students have to submit additional information such as 
a tax transcript. Um, they may have to they may have to turn in a W-2 form. <clears throat> They'll have to complete the verification worksheet. Um, and so it we have to do that in order to be able to administer any federal um, financial aid. It usually takes about one to two weeks or less um, for processing all of those documents once everything is in. And because we go through an audit process, because we are required to, to do this, we have to do it as a university. And then I can go into now that the student has completed the application, he or she may have been selected for verification. Now it's a matter of their financial aid and how they're packaged and what the student has to do. And again, I mentioned the counselor portal. I didn't, I don't know again, how many of you have access to, to that portal. I think that it is a good thing to have access to it because you can um, view a student's financial aid award. Um, and if I, um, I may be able to, to kind of demonstrate that at the end, as well as entertain any questions that you may have. But all of that information is in the portal. And so the student can view exactly what their aid is and they can take action on, on, their, um, on their aid in terms of accepting. Can you advance the slide? Jamie may have, um, she may have stepped away because I'm seeing her. Oh, there she is. Okay. If we can advance the slide, that'd be great. Um, and this is just talking really about how students can accept their, their, um, their loans if they have loans, because a large percentage of our students um, may decide to accept loans. And this is just taking them through the process. Can advance the slide, please. And so what you also would want to know, um, and all of this information in terms of their, um, what their tuition is, um, that information can be found on student accounts uh, services website, what the actual tuition charges are. And because they are, um, uh, well, the, the tuition is, but then what we do in terms of cost of attendance is basically just showing you what um, those figures are based on averages that we have and at some actuals. So actuals in terms of the, the credit hours and then averages in terms of like what's the average room and board based on um, what, our, what our halls are, uh, books and supplies, parking and so forth. And this is just talking again more about student loans in terms of just so that you all know there are extra steps that students have to take when they borrow there's master promissory note there's loan entrance counseling so there's a few extra steps that they have to do if they're going to borrow versus if it's a gift aid or grant um, funds and this is just showing you a promissory note in the event that a student is saying I need to complete a promissory note. At least you kind of know what it looks like. That information can also be found on, on the financial aid website. Um, again, alternative loans, because we do, we do over, I want to say over or right at um, 100, I want to say 100 million or so in uh, student loans is a, is a huge program. So it's a lot about student loans, but you can go ahead and advance that. And now getting to financial aid in my bill. Again, I talked about students accepting their aid. So there is action that the students uh, must take. Um, and in some cases, is if, if it's gift aid from the institution, depending on what type of gift aid, it may automatically be accepted for the student, but other um, types of aid, they may have to take action. So it shows the steps prior to the bills or the aid, I should say, actually dispersing. You'll see estimated aid that actually is applied to their account. So if you looked at their account, you can actually see that, OK, this is the charges, but this is the aid that has credited to their account. And then you can see if there's any if there's a gap for any out of pocket. 
And this is where we said that there's a gap. There may not be a, a gap. And so then that means that the student is actually going to get a refund. And that's the good situation. That's the situation we want our students to be in where they're not in a situation where there's a gap and they have to kind of figure out, well, how am I going to pay? How am I, how am I going to deal with that balance, right? So the refund, it occurs um, basically refunding seven days after the credit um, and, and there's no estimated aid or, or so appears on their account. And the reason why it's seven days is because student account services, they have to process that. And we know that students change their minds on some things. They may add a class, they may drop a class, they may take an action that might impact their refund. And so what student account services would like to do in the perfect world is to ensure that there's no changes at all that's going to occur so that when they do release the credit balance, there's not a situation where then the student made a change and now they owe the university, right? We want to be in that situation where they're not. So we're estimating that on Wednesday, September 8th, that direct deposit will occur and they have a Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Where, and what that means is that money in terms of a credit balance will actually be deposited into their actual bank of their choice because they've set that up with um, their, their, their um, direct deposit their, their banking information and so forth. Um, and then what will happen shortly after that on the 8th is they're showing you that on the 10th of um, September, then paper checks will start running once a week on Fridays. We're trying to get more and more students out of the paper check business <laughs> and more where it is directly deposited into their accounts because that's, a, that's an easy process. Um, it's a seamless process. There's no action that the student would have to take. It's right into their account. And then they can basically um, use that money for any other school related expenses because we know that it's not just the direct um, expenses on their account, but in some cases it's the indirect stuff. Maybe it's some supplies that they have to get. Maybe there was um, you know, some, some type of material that they have to get maybe a laptop, maybe um, some technology needs. And of course, books is, is one of the biggies. And so speaking of books, <laughs> we have a book advanced program. So because we know that students, in many cases, they wanna get their books before the start of the school. And that's to be expected. They have their classes, they're registered for classes. They have all of their aid in place we can determine them based on estimated aid, how much of a refund, if you will, that, that they're able to get. So we can do a book advance um, up to $750 prior to the start of school in the event that the student is gonna get at least 750 or more in a refund or credit balance, if you will. And so in that particular case, if they are, then they'll get a book advance, which is directed, directed um, deposited, I should say, directly into their account, and they can purchase their books and any other, um, again, school-related expenses that they may have. And then general refunding, again, we went over that, how basically once a credit balance appears on their account, within seven days is when student account services is, will release that fund. So if a student, and I know some students are anxious, they see that on their account and they want it yesterday, right? Well, they have to you know, kind of pause there for a second because there's a process and we want to get it right. And so student account services, they reserve the right to um, process that um, you know, in terms of the seven day timeframe. Um, and this is just dealing with some, you know, you've heard the term holds or perhaps financial um, aid holds. Um, in the event that students have a hold on their account, they usually get some type of notice um, with regards to say if their account balance um, isn't paid in full, they'll get they'll start getting some messages. And we talked about the payment installment plan, 50% do the first day of classes, then the 25% and 25%. Well, that's our standard um, 
official, if you will, payment installment plan. But we know that students may fall slightly outside of that plan in terms of them paying their balances. And so if that occurs, then what happens is they start getting notices from student account services about paying their bill and um, their account balance. Um, it, it, well, in the past, it needed to be at least $100 or less for them to register. The university just increased that actually to $500 or less to allow for more students to be able to um, register and not have the financial burden, if you will, be a barrier, I should say, not have it be a barrier for them to register. If you can advance the slide, that'd be great. Um, and then we talked about like the cancellation of classes. Well, in this particular case, it's really what student accounts or the university will do in the event that there is their bill is not paid. And so this is critical that again, well, I should back up. If the student cancels within the first seven days of the first week, then there's the 50% refund, but then there's, I'm sorry, the 100% refund, but then if they go beyond that, so looking at August the 31st through September 14th, they fall within the 50% refund. If they take action afterwards, then they basically are subject to 100% of their bill. And we don't want students to be in that situation. We would rather, um, if they know that they're not going to take the classes, we would rather they do that the first week of school so that they're not harmed in any way uh, financially. You, um, you want to advance the slide? I'm sorry, Leah, I had to step away. What do you need me to do? Um, to advance the slide, if you don't. Okay. Thank you. And this is just showing you um, a sample of what the bill is. If you haven't seen an actual statement, um, this is what the student is seeing. This is what's mailed to them. And it's basically showing that. And then on the flip side, where you see the yellow highlighted um, pieces, that's showing you that um, where that federal direct loan did apply to their account. You can continue to advance. Um, and then you have situations where if a student actually completely withdrew from the university, um, and if it's that they then owe, they're this, and that the student feels that it was it was necessary to necessary to withdraw, and then they can contact the Office of Student Financial Assistance can to discuss the situation to see if there's something we can do about it. If it's a situation where the student may appeal, we understand that life happens. And so we would rather get, we would rather know um, on the front end versus the tail end where we can perhaps be an advocate and assist students through that process. So the worst thing that a student can do is just walk away. We don't want that to happen. We would rather have that conversation so as you're meeting with students, um, if you're hearing that they are sharing information with you about you know, some of their challenges and they feel that they need to withdraw, have them contact the financial assistance office. We work closely with the office of the registrar. Um, we work closely with housing. Um, we definitely work closely with student account services and we can um, work with the students who identify the best options for them. We can identify options and kind of help them navigate that process. Because there are consequences for actions. For example, non-payment, we talked about classes, the possibility of classes being dropped. So anything dealing with their bill in terms of their classes, whether it's they need to drop or it's because they're being getting warnings from student account services about being dropped, you would want them to contact student account services, contact the financial assistance office. Again, we work very closely with them. Before it gets to, we don't want it to get to the Kentucky Department of Revenue, basically collections. We don't want it, that to happen because then not so good things happen when it gets to them. Um, you all probably also heard of satisfactory academic progress. Um, because we are, um, we participate in Title IV aid, 
we have to abide by, again, federal government requirements. And so what the federal government ask us to do as a college or university is we have to monitor the student's progress. We have to make certain that the student is progressing toward their degree. And so, or they at least maintain it a 2.0 cumulative grade point average, because you need that to graduate in most all of the programs. Um, has the student earned um, a cumulative of 60, 70% of their attempted credit hours? Those things are all calculated in their or satisfactory academic progress um, when we do a review. And then it just will basically that's the math and it will tell us who's falling below those 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 uh, requirements. And then we send out notices to those students to let them know they're not meeting satisfactory academic progress. However, they can go through an appeal process. I'm going to go to the next slide, please. Um, scholarships, students that are attending the NKU receiving merit um, scholarships, um, they are required to meet scholarship renewal criteria. And each scholarship differs. Many of them are either a 3.0 or good academic standing, maybe some are slightly higher. And on the financial aid website, it outlines what they are. I can tell you that during the um, national pandemic, with COVID, we did relax um, the scholarship criteria and we automatically renewed students because we understood, you know, wanted to be sensitive of what everyone was dealing with with, with regards to COVID. And then there's also um, outside scholarships of which we do not control. So um, that's uh, student account services usually work closely with making certain that outside scholarships are processed. But if there are requirements that the um, donor has set out, then they would need to meet that. We also um, administer uh, funds and assist students with their 529 plans in terms of how that is um, drawn down and, and basically credited to students' accounts. Um, okay, you can add, uh, advance that one. And then, of course, our veterans, our student veterans, we have the Veterans Resource Station. We also have the um, third floor of the Administrative Center, where we have one stop of which there's a presence there to assist veterans, as well as um, all, all of our other students that would come in there. If they have questions about any of their veterans' benefits, about the, um, the certification process, how that works, um, and um, any other resources that they may uh, take advantage of. So it's, it's our job or our desire, I should say, to really help them, help them through that process. And um, the, many of the um, campaigns that we roll out, again, is to advance the student from one academic year to the next, but also from um, as they go from freshman to sophomore all the way through to um, graduating um, and our, how our scholarships are built is that we want students to um, earn at least 30 credit hours a year. And we've also included where we can count summer into that, you know, uh, length of the year as summer being a trailer. And so that supports the whole campaign of 15 to finish that the state was very much involved in, as well as when we talk about um, students that are Kentucky residents that receive either keys or cap, they're looking at how are students progressing? Are they progressing towards graduating um, or are they just taking credit hours, right? And so if they're getting these funds and because we're participating in federal programs as well as state programs, we have to monitor that. We can't, we're not just dispersing aid and not monitoring um, what the students are doing. Are they graduating or are they attempting to um, to progress again from freshman to sophomore and so forth. And, and these were just, um, just where we are, who we are, um, where these offices are, office hours and so forth um, in the event that either you have a question or you may decide that you're gonna walk a student over um, to um, our office. So I think now what I would like to do is, and I don't know, 
um, Jamie, how much time we have, but I would like to open it up for any questions and then perhaps I can do um, some either group or one-on-one. -on -one. I didn't get a sense of really how many people had like the student portal to go in, or I should say the counselor portal to actually go in and, and really look at some of, some of the things that I went over. So Leah, when you say counselor portal, do you mean the academic advising tab? Well, that's a different tab. So there is okay. a, a counselor tab within the My NKU. So it's the it's a <clears throat> counselor entry once you go to the financial aid tab. Mm -hmm. Um, so there is a question in the chat, and I do appreciate that. Thank you, Amy. In terms of FERPA, FERPA works for not just our first-time freshmen, but it could be also for our transfer students. So what happens is if you are a student, whether you, you are a first-time freshman or a transfer student, if you sign the FERPA to allow for parents to actually view, to have a conversation, so as an academic advisor, some of those conversations could be tough conversations because it could be dealing with grades. And so one, you can say, yep, I, will, I don't mind my parents looking at my grades and therefore can have a conversation about those grades, right? We like to try to really talk to the students and really work with the students, but we do also realize that parents or involved in the process in, in, in some cases. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but we just wanna be careful about what we share with parents because a lot of the information is very, could be sensitive information. Rather it's about, again, grades, GPA. Rather it's about, gee, this student's not even enrolled here anymore and the parents don't know. Um, rather it's about financial, you know, hey, this student got received a refund and now they still oh why what happened here so it's just again some very can be sensitive information good question okay one second So the question um, really is about, um, again, transfer students and uh, about what advice um, about, about transfer students and scholarships and deadlines and so forth. So one, um, NKU is not unique in that our premier scholarship program is for our traditional right out of high school students. That doesn't mean that we don't care about our transfer students because we do, we care about all students. And so for transfer students, if you, um, there, there are a number of opportunities, rather it be if they're part of any, any of our community college um, partnerships, there are some benefits to being in those partnerships. So if they're in say Gateway to NKU, there are opportunities where they can um, after their, they take 15 credit hours, they can get one class at, at NKU at the rate of the gateway tuition. So they get that reduced benefit, which is a good thing. Um, once they transfer, they can um, qualify for um, transfer awards. Um, there are or awards ranging from $2,000 up to if they are not a... Um, a um, Kentucky resident, depending on which partnership that they transfer from, whether it's, if it's Cincinnati State, they could qualify for the, um, what we call is the tip, which is basically taking $5,200 off of their award. But then there's also donor scholarships that they can apply for. And that information um, is found on our website. We typically um, roll out or open up the scholarship um, application, I want to say around October or so. So if they're looking at the possibility of transferring, I would have them look at that um, in terms of any donor opportunities. And of course, just as our um, first time freshmen, we also push them to complete the free application for federal um, student aid so that they can 
um, take advantage of those opportunities as well. So there, there are some opportunities there. Again, I get it, our premier program is, is for the first time freshmen. So there's another um, question. So when the emails from student account services go out regarding the student being dropped from courses, um, they look as if they come from our department. Is there a way that student account services can um, instead mail? Okay, so you're asking about if they could be mailed. And I think, um, Jamie, you might wanna follow up with Brandon uh, Billiter on that. I don't really, I feel a little uncomfortable speaking um, for student account services. Unfortunately, they were not able to be part of this presentation, but I do know that they, had it, um, in the past, <laughs> they have mailed, uh, emailed those out and they've not gone out um, to the home address. And it could be a matter of, um, that's just their process, the way the system is built to just automatically generate those. Because again, as I mentioned, they are uh, monthly uh, statements that are, that are emailed out. Right, it, it looks like the question might be asking if there's a way that it could look like it comes from student account services rather than the department itself. Hi, Leah. Yes. Hi, it's Tina. Hi, Tina. Hello. So yeah, we have had students contact us in the past because they've received an email that looks like it came from our department indicating that they had been dropped from one of their courses. And then when we investigate it, it turns out it's not something that even came from us. Um, so we know now that those come from student account services, but it looks from the student's side of things when they receive it, it looks like it went out from, in my case, the Department of Biological Sciences indicating to them that they may be dropped from their course, but really it came from student account services. And so I'm wondering if there's a way and this, as you said, this may be something I need to address with Brandon, um, but I'm wondering if there's a way that when they send it out, instead of sending it so that it looks like it comes from us, if they could send it under their own masthead with their information and, and their contact uh, number. Okay, I get it. So yeah, I would think that that's uh, a, a student account services thing for them to address. And it may be just as easy as them basically looking at that uh, email and making modifications to um, the look and feel of it. So again, yeah, I would, I would definitely, uh, Jamie, if you want to, and I can have a conversation with Brandon too, but sounds like he's not going to be back until July 6th. Right. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you both. Mm -hmm. Oh, no problem. Do you all get into the um, portal much where you are actually looking at things like the bill or like the financial aid um, information? No. And, and the thing is, we're not expecting you all to be financial aid experts. I think having a general knowledge of how this works. And hopefully I accomplish that <laughs> in terms of trying to really just show you kind of like if you look at the time frame of when things occur, right? So they come in, they register for classes. We know that they we encourage them to complete the application on an annual basis. If they do that and all things are good, their estimated aid, their bill, those thing, things meet up. If they are going to get a refund, then we talked about the whole book advance and those things happen every semester. So when we look at fall, I should say this, they happen during the academic year. So when we look at fall, spring is gonna mirror the same things that we did in fall, except for if the dates are different because they're spring dates, right? They don't have to complete the application in between those times. It's only the one year they're doing it for the academic year that runs basically fall and spring with summer being an optional um, summer. So Leah, there's a question about whether they should direct students from an 
advising standpoint just to the general um, Office of Financial Aid or if there's someone specific that they right. need to talk so, to? I would say to the general Office of Financial Aid, but I am going to say this too, um, that as we gear up for fall semester, the volume increases and we all know that. Um, but we have worked hard to allow for various ways that students can, can contact us. So they can email us. So the financial aid email address account, all of that information is on our website. They can call us. They can do the chat bot. They can sign up for a virtual chat appointment. They can walk in. So I would say we would want to give students all of those opportunities of which they can contact us. Now, the other thing too, is you may have a contact that you work with on a, on a kind of a regular basis. I'm not saying to move away from that contact because I try to get contacts in almost every office on the campus so that I know that, okay, I'm gonna, I, but I do the legwork. So I will call my contact. The student may be in my office and I'm having that conversation trying to figure that thing out, right? And then I can turn to the student and say, okay, this is what you do. Now for me, again, as soon as call me, they, um, they, call, they call me, they find me, and I don't have a problem with that either. So if you wanna, if you wanna give them my telephone number, I, I really don't have a problem. A lot of information goes out with my name on it and they will email me or call me as well. So I think it's a matter of what is the situation? And you know, in some cases it may be a urgent situation where you really feel like I need to, you know, I need to escalate this. I, I really need to get be involved in it. And that's absolutely fine um, to do that. I mean, we're all here to service our students, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, if, if that kind of helps. And then Someone they would like, inquired yeah, about they have in the PowerPoint and Jamie, you have it. So if you want yeah. to share that, that's okay. perfectly fine as well, because there was some information that you may need to reference, feel like you need to reference back. I know and I was trying to get everything in, um, in the time frame that we had. So, and sometimes I may go a little fast with that as well. So I will send that out to everybody who's on here. Any other questions? No. Well, so I'm sure that, oh, yes, there is another one here. Did you see that one down there? Okay, sure. That's a good question. So this question is basically about the the uh, tuition appeal process, and so um, that process is is similar in a in a way that I view it to um, kind of the satisfactory academic progress process. With the tuition appeal process, however, it's dealing with the tuition. So the student um, probably needed to drop probably needed to drop and didn't drop the classes, right? And so they're stuck with the bill. And so if there were some extreme situations, so for example, say if the student was in a um, pretty bad car accident and had to be hospitalized and didn't get an opportunity to even work with their faculty members on, can I get um, an extension on some things can I take an incomplete in order to, once I'm okay, you know, re, uh, resume work on whatever the, um, the work was to take care of it. We always ask for things like medical documentation. Um, we, we look at, you know, could the student have contacted and worked with their faculty? We want, we would prefer them to, but we also understand that depending on the situation, they may not have been able to. It also could be a situation where maybe there is, you know, usually these cases are unfortunate situations, a death in the family, in which again, depending on how that student actually dealt with that situation, when it actually occurred, um, you know, could the student have worked with a faculty member? Maybe not. For whatever reason, and we'll try we'll try to work with that student, but it does require documentation 
um, from that student. If that kind of helps with the tuition appeals question. And student account services has has that information also on their um, on their website. Any other questions for Leah? Well, I'm sure if Leah, or if you have any questions, Leah won't mind if you email her or call her. That would be um, great. Okay. Because I tried to cover a lot and, and it's covering more than just financial aid, right? Right, yeah. If you all have questions, do not hesitate to contact me with the questions or what have you. You all will receive the PowerPoint, so yes. you'll have that as a, as a resource, um, um, you know, document or what have you. Yeah. So I will go ahead and send that out. And thank you so much, Leah, for coming and doing this. Sorry you were on your own, but you did a great <laughs> job with it. So, okay. Thank All right. You. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye.